Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm Michelle, and uh, today I'd like to talk about the hierarchy of money. Um, so the fact that there is an inherent hierarchy to every monetary system. Um, so I'm going to introduce a um, relatively simple model and then apply that to digital assets and Bitcoin more specifically. Um, so let's get started. Um, I think that it's really important to understand that um, money is not just one particular thing, but it can actually take various forms and shape, even within the same uh, monetary system. So if you ask people in the street uh, who creates money, most would probably say um, the central bank, and that's entirely correct. So you have the central bank that creates what we call central bank money. So physical cash, coins, notes, and so on that are available to everyone, but also electronic bank reserves, which are only available to, let's say, a select club of uh, privileged commercial banks. And so all of that money is the liability of the central bank, and that's what we call the base money or the base money supply. Now, commercial banks also create money or credit in the forms of uh, bank deposits. So unlike central bank money, these are actually liabilities of the commercial banks that issue them. And um, they are effectively promises to pay currency or central bank money. And so that's generally what most people use uh, when they settle their obligations and do payments. And so those two types of instruments taken together is what we call the narrow money supply. Um, but since the 1970s, actually, what we've seen is, is a massive surge or increase in what we call market-based uh, money or credit creation uh, by the financial sector, and that is creation of credit in the form of securities. Um, so securities being promises to pay money or currency over some um, time horizon in the future, if you will. Um, so examples of that are uh, money market fund shares, commercial paper, and so on, but really more generally or broadly, pretty much any type of debt security. And so these are liabilities of the financial sector or what we commonly call also the shadow banking system. Um, and so all of these taken together is what we call the broad money supply. So that's the, the total money supply essentially of an economy. And so as you can see, the money supply is based on a variety of different financial instruments uh, and effectively credit. So we can also visually represent this. Um, so here, just as a quick note, um, this is just for illustrative purposes. So the bubble sizes do not reflect at all the actual sizes. So otherwise, security uh, would probably take, take over the whole screen here. Um, so in some cases, in some monetary systems, you also have something that's called a reserve asset. Um, that's generally commodity money. So um, money that's nobody's liability. So most commonly that uh, has been gold historically. Um, now, as you can see, there is already a sort of natural hierarchy that emerges. So you, you can imagine there's a sort of like a pyramid, if you will. And this natural hierarchy of all these different forms of, or essentially different financial instruments that all to some extent pretend to be money uh, exists, but is mostly hidden uh, in, in our everyday lives. And the reason that it's mostly hidden and only becomes really apparent in times of, let's say, financial distress is because there's an elaborate system of um, security dealers and market makers that operate in between of all of these layers uh, and manage different prices of money. So first we have the uh, central bank that manages the exchange rate. So the price of central bank money in terms of the reserve assets or uh, otherwise another, um, let's say, international or national um, currency. Then we have the banking sector that manages the price of bank deposits in terms of central bank money. And so that price should ideally always be the same, so what we call it being on par. And finally, we have the securities uh, dealers that manage the interest rate. So the price of securities or promises to pay in the future in terms of commercial bank money or currency. And Already here, you can also see that there's a natural hierarchy between these actors um, because these agents cannot create forms of money that are above or at a higher layer uh, than themselves in the hierarchy. So, for example, the banking sector can't create central bank money and securities dealers, they cannot create bank deposits. So let's turn this around. So this is going to be our main model, this pyramid. Um, relatively simple, so in reality it's a bit more complex, there's more fine-grained layers in between, but I think for our purposes um, this simple model serves, serves us well, very well. Um, so I guess the key question now becomes really in this system, what is money and what is credit? So let's first define those two terms. So 
money, uh, in my view, is the ultimate means of selling an obligation or promise to pay. Whereas credits is precisely that promise to pay or an, an obligation essentially to, to pay something in the future. And now at first it might seem actually pretty obvious of um, what is money and what is credit in the system. But actually in reality and in practice, the lines are really blurry. So it's not very clear cut. Um, and the main reason for that is that what counts as money at one layer of the hierarchy really is considered credit by the layer above. So essentially what counts as money depends primarily on your position in that very hierarchy. Um, so to give you an example, um, we generally pay, and as most businesses do, with uh, commercial bank money to sell our, all our obligations, so bank deposits. So to us, bank deposits are money because we can sell those obligations in it. Now to the banks that actually handle those payments, bank deposits are promises to pay. And they only settle the obligations between themselves in the base money with central bank reserves. So to them, central bank reserves or base money is the actual money, whereas bank deposits are credit. Um, so in order to illustrate this point, um, let's, let's add two more axes to this particular model. So we have the y-axis that um, highlights essentially the degree of moneyness, if you will. So the uh, quality of all these different financial instruments in terms of how much does it qualify as being money. Uh, and then the x-axis, which is effectively the money supply. Um, so the quantity of money or credit that exists in a system. And so the fact that there is credit that is really inherent in every monetary system is, is actually a very useful function because it provides us with uh, elasticity. And elasticity is the ability of the money supply to actually dynamically adjust to increase demand for money uh, which generally happens in times of booms. Um, so what happens is that actually the money supply expands through the um, creation of new credit. And so what's also interesting in these boom phases where there's lots of new credit that's being created is that the qualitative differences between these instruments generally tends to be, um, let's say, neglected to some extent. So people and businesses, they don't really see much differences between these uh, actually different forms of money. And that stops or becomes actually quite the opposite in terms of financial distress and crisis. So when confidence levels and trust actually plummets, and so effectively uh, credit is being destroyed, which then actually also reduces the actual money supply. And it is precisely in those times of financial crisis where you start really seeing the qualitative differences between all these financial instruments. And so you can then also see a rush to essentially the highest quality forms of money, which are generally higher up. Uh, in the hierarchy. Um, so I would say that this is actually a key feature of any monetary system that you can dynamically expand and contract the supply of money. And this is not only based on the fiat currency um, system, but also as we're going to see with Bitcoin, um, this is pretty much every monetary system that has this inherent ability, which generally also is not something that's prescribed top down but rather emerges, um, let's say, organically and naturally over time from the bottom up. Um, and maybe before I forget, um, so the element of discipline, so let me actually go back. So here you can see the base money here. There's actually two elements of discipline. So that uh, puts a sort of, let's say, constraint to the creation of credit. So the first one is, that, uh, as we've seen before, that agents cannot create forms of money uh, that are above them, so at higher layers at the hierarchy. And then second is the actual base money itself. Um, so in the gold standard, there used to be the quantity of gold uh, available in a certain country. Uh, now with fiat currencies, it, it's actually the quantity and supply of central bank reserves that puts in a, a limit to some extent at least uh, to the creation of credit at the, the lower layers. So um, let's move to digital assets now. So first I, I would like to talk about digital assets, um, let's say as they relate to the traditional monetary system. And we're going to take a US perspective here. Um, so let's use the same model that hopefully uh, you guys are a bit more familiar with by now. So in, in the system here, base money is effectively exactly the same as central bank reserves. It's just we call that today central bank digital currency or CBDC. Um, and that is effectively just a digital version of um, base money. Now, to date, as far as I'm aware, in the US, there is no CBDC yet. Um, but there is actually a project that comes pretty close to it. Um, it's called Finality. And so they are tokenizing central bank reserves. So I would say they fit somewhere in between there. 
Um, the equivalent of bank deposits in terms of digital assets is what I would call bank-based stable coins, um, like JPM coin, um, like Signature Bank, Signa Platform, or the Silvergate Exchange Network. And so as you, as you can see, I'll put stable coins in quotation marks because in my opinion, those are not actually real tokens or coins. They're effectively just digital bank deposits um, that exist in an internal closed system and, and enable you to actually quickly move money around, but only within that closed system. Um, next, we have fiat-backed stable coins that are issued by uh, non-banks. And as you can see, we've already left uh, the banking sector and we're right down in the securities uh, sector here. And again, security is not necessarily in the legal sense of the term, but more in practical terms. Um, so these are effectively stable coins um, that are collateralized uh, either by bank deposits or other um, short-term money instruments. And effectively what they are, they are IEU, so promises to redeem uh, or be redeemable against commercial bank money or bank deposits. And so as you can see, there, there might be some qualitative differences between, between these instruments as well. So for example, I would think that some people would consider Tether uh, to be less credit worthy than let's say a regulated stable coin like USDC, although I guess it depends uh, on, on how you look at it. But then adding another layer of abstraction here, we have crypto collateralized stable coins like DAI for example, uh, or is it called SIA now? I can't remember actually. Um, but so here the, the idea is that it is not even collateralized by fiat currencies or, or fiat instruments, but actually by other crypto assets. Um, and yet another layer of abstraction would be algorithmic stable coins, which are actually not backed by anything, um, like let's say new bits and steam dollar. And again, there are also qualitative difference between all of these. Um, so I think what's also important here to understand is that actually this doesn't even include um, tokenized, let's say um, bank deposits or any other kind of, of securities like think digital securities, uh, security tokens, and so on, of more traditional instruments. And so in my opinion, this is fundamentally gonna change really over the next, um, uh, let's say five to 10 years actually. But let's move to cryptocurrency, which actually in my opinion, the most, um, let's say, interesting aspect of all of this. So I I'd like to set them apart because in my uh, view, cryptocurrencies are effectively monetary systems on their own. Uh, they have also their own unit of account. And so to illustrate the point, I'm gonna use Bitcoin here as a case study uh, for, well, I guess, obvious reasons. Um, so let's use the same model again. So what is the equivalent of base money uh, in the Bitcoin monetary system? Well, that's on-chain BTC, so the UTXOs that are recorded and stored uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain. And I would consider those to be a synthetic commodity money, so synthetic, a synthetic that it's um, essentially not tangible, uh, and commodity money because it is no one's um, liability. And what's interesting about Bitcoin is that it has this property of provable scarcity, um, which is enforced by the protocol rules. So it already adds an, 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 a massive element of discipline in the whole monetary system because you can't just create new uh, on-chain BTC out of thin air. Um, the equivalent of bank deposits in the Bitcoin monetary system is what I would call representative BTC balances. So these are effectively IOUs, um, so promises to uh, redeem against uh, on-chain BTC. Um, now, the Lightning Network is quite an, let's say, odd edge case because it's not really on-chain BTC. Um, it's not either really an, 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 an IOU in the traditional sense of the term. So I would put the Lightning Network somewhere in between there, um, but I guess this would be probably worth just a talk on its own. Um, so I'll just leave it there for now. Um, but so moving back to the representative bit, uh, BTC balances. So first we have Bitcoin or BTC on other blockchains. Um, so that would be something like, let's say T uh, BTC, uh, where the pack is um, at least claimed to be trust minimized. Uh, next here in the hierarchy, I would say you have something like liquid BTC or LBTC, where the pack would be maintained or is maintained by, uh, let's say a federation of different uh, entities. And then further down, you would have something like wrap BTC, uh, where the pack is maintained by just a single custodian. And so that is just exactly the same thing as um, custodial service providers, where you have Bitcoin balances essentially in their internal systems. Uh, and that is the same as just holding an, a digital deposit certificate, if you like. 
And so securities um, in the Bitcoin monetary uh, system are essentially all Bitcoin-based financial instruments. So promises really to pay BTC in the future. Uh, and so that can range from um, lending to investment trusts, to trackers, to derivatives and so on. Uh, and I think this is really an, an emerging and fast developing uh, market segment that I'm actually not too familiar with. Um, so I'll definitely love to do more analysis on this. Uh, but just taking a step back here, um, I think, again, it's, it's interesting to see that, again, this notion of credit being really inherent to any monetary system, um, including something like Bitcoin. Um, and I would actually say that this is a good thing in itself, um, as long as, of course, users are aware of the differences between these instruments and they can actually freely move and use uh, and use uh, also essentially freely move between these um, these instruments. So just before I finish, um, so lots of people, especially Bitcoiners, like to talk about uh, what's called the Bitcoin standard. So essentially Bitcoin, a new international monetary order that's based on Bitcoin as a reserve asset or reserve currency. Um, so I think like gold and pretty much any other commodity money, um, the property of uh, essentially being politically neutral, so being nobody's liability, is very useful for international holds at settlement. Uh, and similarly, the fact that it's provably scarce, um, so that it has that natural element of discipline, is also a very important characteristic in that context. But the main problem that I see with that is that politically neutral assets generally work mostly or mainly, let's say, in a multipolar world. So a situation or world order that's characterized by multiple powers that have a certain balance between themselves, uh, don't trust themselves and don't want to use each other's currency. And so that's really the environment, so that multipolarity or multipolar order um, where these politically neutral assets thrive. And now, despite what you hear about China, and although lots of people probably won't like this, but I still think that we live in a unipolar world um, that is completely dominated by the United States. Um, so just for example, the dollar, so the USD um, underpins pretty much all of global trade. Uh, and it is really the key asset that, that underpins also international finance. Um, and if that's not enough, well, then it, the US still has by far um, the strongest monetary on the planet by, by really a wide, wide margin. And frankly, I do not really see any serious uh, contender there, at least in the short or medium term. And so, in my opinion, at least, unless the world becomes more multipolar, um, I don't really see a chance where Bitcoin or something like gold, for example, same counts for gold as well, uh, will really become a de facto reserve currency that underpins a new monetary order. Um, but that actually doesn't mean that Bitcoin uh, won't have its role to play. So um, I definitely think that it's going to continue to develop and grow um, its own monetary system. So the one that we've just seen. Um, also, what I think we can, what we can increasingly see in the, in the let's say, near to medium term future um, is that more and more countries will actually consider Bitcoin as one of several components uh, of their foreign uh, exchange reserves. So just alongside gold. Although for that, um, the volatility would probably need to decrease uh, quite a bit, though. And then finally, as well, and that it can be or will be increasingly used as a high-powered um, and also auditable collateral in uh, traditional finance. But again, for that, the volatility still would need to uh, to decrease quite substantially. And I frankly think that this is not too bad for an asset that um, has barely existed for ten years. And so I think uh, the future sounds really exciting for Bitcoin.